So um, we're very fortunate to have uh, our speaker today, Dr. Bud Kluge, who's an associate research professor in the Department of Health Sciences at the uh, University of South Carolina. You can boo now. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, when we were thinking of, you know, who, this is really the only presentation on soil that we have in the, the seminar series, and we were thinking of who should we ask to give this talk. Um, Dr. Clue Buzz was the first person that I thought of because of the really interesting work he's doing um, with uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. He's uh, got quite a bit of funding from them to do to help to kind of promote soil health um, here in South Carolina and also to do on-farm research. And that's the other interesting thing is he's um, working on farm, doing research on farm. Um, he actually knows he farmers. Do, he knows farmers, and he's actually uh, evaluating different practices like cover cropping um, for benefits on soil health. And as he, he'll probably undoubtedly talk about, he's, his results are sort of changing our conventional wisdom on you know our farmers' approach to using um, fertilizers. Um, he's also been involved in a lot of um, developing video series on soil health that you can go on YouTube. I think he has a channel or something you can see. Um, one of them is called The Science of Soil Health, and they're outstanding videos. Um, so he might may talk a little bit more about that. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kluke. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do you guys mind if I take my shirt off? <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> It's warm, but I, I, I wore this for you guys. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> I was wearing the US t shirt. Yeah, no, I don't. Uh, when, we're, when South Carolina is as bad as it is, I just keep my mouth shut. So. So, uh. All right, there we go. Um, okay, oh, I guess you don't know what the sound is, but that should be okay. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, this is basically a class in sustainable agriculture. Is that right? That's the seminar. Is that what it's called? And local food systems. Okay. And and thanks for that plug on soils. I want to say that none of the work that I do is original. Uh, somebody has already discovered this sometimes hundreds of years ago. So nothing. We're just rediscovering it, and we're just, we're rediscovering it in the southeast as well. And so we're just reconfirming the stuff. But, you know, we're, I want to share with you sort of my journey in the last five years. And, and I'll tell you that when we started this five years ago, um, I'm going to introduce you to a, a, some, a, a fellow who I'll sort of just generally call. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But we, we've been met with a lot of derision in the sense that uh, we have been told multiple times, but uh, certainly in the beginning of this journey, that this stuff, there's no scientific basis for this. And as we've gone along, we've actually found uh, sort of the, the, the opposite, that there's not that much scientific base for a purely geochemical approach to farming. And so let, let's just talk about that. How long do I have to talk over here? Um, so four 425. Oh, 15 minutes. Okay, so you can start waving your arms. And when everybody falls asleep, we can just walk out anyway. So, all right, so just, I just want to talk, tell you a little bit about me. I come from that great grain producing country called Namibia. We probably have about 40 acres of arable land in our country. Uh, where I worked over here, we had one inch of rain a year. So you can imagine lots of row crops and vineyards and that stuff, right? South Carolina fits into, I'm being really sarcastic. It's a desert country, Namibia. South Carolina fits into Namibia here. We have about 12 inches of rain up here a year, okay? And uh, I, um, in my former life, I was a chemical engineer. I worked at Rossing Uranium Mine. We milled 40,000 tons a day. I ended up running the plant there. Um, and I loved chemistry because chemistry, especially, I, I got so confused, I gave up in uh, organic chemistry, so I took as little as I could and stopped in my second year. Loved inorganic chemistry because 
That's how I saw the world. You could take the entire world and you could grind it down, press it, fuse it, you could put it into an ICP or a GC, and these numbers would come out and you could make sense of these numbers. And that was the way I viewed the, viewed the world at the time. I thought, you know, everything we could basically ba break down into chemistry. Uh, when I came uh, to South Carolina, you know, it was a natural fit for me to become an aquatic scientist, um, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. Went to USC, okay, boo, okay. Right, so that was me. I became an aquatic scientist because uh, part of what I did uh, at the uranium plant was I ran the tailings dam, and we had a lot of interest in the water and the water quality. So chemistry fit in right there. I happened to do a little bit of microbiology with the studies that I did, but in, invariably my attitude was chemical. Um, I started doing some work for the USDA. Um, I'm a what is known as a research professor, so basically I have to eat what I kill, and so USC doesn't pay my salary. I have to basically get contracts and grants, and then that comes to USC, and that's how my salary is paid. But they don't say, well, this is Buzz Clute, and we've got to reserve a salary for him. And so uh, in, in the interest of doing anything legal for money, somebody said, well, can you do a series of films for us? And I got interested in filmmaking, and, and, and to call myself a filmmaker would be kind of um, a hyperbole. I'm a storyteller that uses videos. Uh, but what happened was, was I started getting out into the fields and into farms, and um, I suddenly started learning. And I would say, without doubt, and you could say may, maybe this is because you see, without doubt, since I picked up the camera, I've learned more about farming than I ever did during my w when I got my PhD. And so I was thinking, Dalai, the Dalai Lama said, uh, and I, I'm not trying to promote any religion. But I like what he says, you know, when you talk like I'm doing now, you're only repeating what you heard. When you listen, you might learn something new. And so I'd, I'd encourage you guys to remember that. Um, part of, and I'm, I'm still trying to articulate this whole thing because uh, it's been five years. I've had a basic brain transplant where I don't think in terms of geochemistry anymore. I think in terms of biogeochemistry. So I've had to have a massive paradigm shift, and we've seen a paradigm shift happen in the last 20 years, but it's probably started happening more recently. And the paradigm shift has really been sort of um, very different to what you'll see in modern production agriculture, where the basic philosophy towards nature is, you know, man dominates nature. You know, we. We get our tractors and our fuel and everything else, and we, we do what we need to do to make, make, produce a crop. So we can produce, you know, 14,000 acres of farm row crop in Arizona. It doesn't matter that it doesn't rain there. We can still do that because of all the irrigation water. Uh, whereas the soil health movement was this whole idea of we work with and not against nature. Um, there's a litany of, of things that, uh, different paradigm shifts that have happened. And these guys uh, in the soil health movement, and I'll talk to you, the whole soil health movement has not been driven by industry. It's not been driven by academics. It's actually been driven by farmers. So this is kind of a grassroots movement that's happened. And it's, it's meant that academics like, well, I don't know if I call myself, but academics like Jeff and other people actually are running to, to keep up behind the farmers. I, I barely know what I'm doing. So, but one of the things um, that we see in some of the science disciplines or the conceptual model of soils, if you look at the old conceptual model of soils, was that uh, soil scientists were taught that soil is a medium to grow plants. And in reality, Soils are living mutualistic ecosystems, and hopefully we can get into that. And as a result, science was defined often as geochemistry instead of biogeochemistry. When we talk about the Earth's crust down to the first, you know, 100, 100 miles, geochemistry works. When we're talking about the top six foot, 
its biogeochemistry because about 90% of soil function, that's the ability of uh, plants to get water, the ability of uh, plants to get nutrients happens biologically. We take that biology away and we have to pay for those functions. So I'm going to leave that. We may come back to that uh, at a little stage, uh, a, a little in a little while. Let's carry on, and uh, let me tell you the story or my story. Um, about 20, 30 years ago, a number of farmers across the country independently started coming to a conclusion that this stuff that I'm being given doesn't work. So guys like Gabe Brown. Gabe Brown in North Dakota had four crop failures in a year, uh, 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 in four years. And the only thing he had left was basically seed. And he could not basically fertilize or spray his way out of a situation. And he went towards diversity. Um, he's one of the foremost farmer speakers right now. And, and he's really a leading light. So North Dakota... Um, Gabe Brown, Dave Brandt is in Ohio, and Gabe is, uh, uh, sorry, Dave is slightly eccentric, doesn't believe in crop insurance, never did, started growing cover crops 20, 25 years ago. Ray Steyer started growing cover crops uh, 25, 30 years ago, or went no till 40 years ago, started cover crops 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago. Um, and Ray says he has neighbors that accuse him of irrigating at night, okay? So he doesn't have any, any irrigation equipment. And then, um, geez, what's his name? He's in Iowa. I can't remember his name. So, hmm? I'm from Iowa. You're from Iowa. Well, uh, <laughs> Oh, come on now, that, I can't believe that I don't remember his name. He's, but, but, but these guys are leading lights. And so we see this movement sort of organically taking off about 20 years ago. And um, there's a guy. Anyone, anyone know who this is? Okay, write his name down if you're interested in this stuff. His name's Ray Archuleta. And uh, Ray Archuleta works for the USDA NRCS. He's actually a government employee, but he's kind of become one of the most um, influential representatives of the soil health movement. And, you know, because of him, the USDA has changed a lot of its policy, and he has really good relationships with all these guys and 2,000 other of his closest friends. Um, so I, I met Ray about five years ago when I was doing uh, some video work. And, uh, and, and here's, here's what happened to me. I was already becoming disillusioned with aquatic sciences because basically I realized that with aquatic sciences, you're measuring D-O-P-H, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, okay, and you're measuring fish kills and that kind of stuff. So what, what are you really doing there? You, you're kind of measuring, you're, you're determining cause of death because no matter, and it's like being um, a coroner instead of a healer in the medical profession. You're determining cause of death because by the time the water has got into the waterway, it's game over. And when I met Ray, I suddenly realized that if we deal with the cause of water pollution rather than the symptoms, there's hope. And so that gave me hope, and I pretty much dropped all my interest in uh, sort of pure aquatic sciences and started to uh, go down the, the way of soils because I realized if we take care of the soils, water quality takes care of itself. So the, the five principles of soil health, often, you know, people, I have friends who say to me, Buzz, you need to write a book and give us a step-by-step -step method. You know, how do you do the soil health stuff? And it's not about methods because there's a million methods. The big thing over here is how do we adhere to principles? There are a few principles. The methods are many. And the first principle is minimum disturbance of the soil, okay? That, that, that means physical, chemi chemical, and biological. One of the biggest things that you can do to, to, to cut that disturbance down 
is to cut uh, any kind of tillage. So what you can see is there's a layer of residue. I took this picture in, in South Dakota. I'm doing a little bit work of work out there. So the first thing is minimum disturbance, and big thing is stop tillage. That's, that's kind of the first thing we like to do. The second principle is keep, a, keep the soil covered. Think about nature. Is there any time when nature has vast areas of land that are uncovered, vast areas of soils that are uncovered? The only time we're going to see that is if a guy takes a disc out to his field or her field and discs it up. In nature, you might find small patches. Uh, what, what will grow in small patches out in nature of, of bare dirt? Is that me? Let me turn this off. What happens when you have a little bit of bare dirt? What's, what's the first thing that's going to grow there? Grasses. Pardon me? Grasses. grasses. And even before the grasses? Um, yeah, weeds, basically. Okay, the natural function of weeds, okay, is, that, is to keep the soil covered and to add diversity to the soil. So the, first, the second principle, keep the soil covered either with residue, a layer of duff, or with a plant canopy. The third principle is to keep a live root in the soil year round. This is one of my farmers uh, down in Eastover, South Carolina. He's a corn and soybean farmer, and this is his cover crop um, around, uh, around March 15. So the reason why we keep a live root in the soil year round, as many days of the year as possible, is um, one of the doctrines that we, sort of prevailing doctrines that we have in the old paradigm is that plants suck nutrients up and they take nutrients out. Um, what uh, often people neglect, uh, do not know, is that about anywhere between 5 and 40% of a plant's photosynthetic energy goes back into the soil through root exudates in terms of usually carbohydrates, but also hormones. And that um, basically attracts a guild of microbes around the soil, around the roots in the rhizosphere, what we call the rhizosphere. And those sugars then feed plant microbes or soil microbes. Those microbes in turn provide services to the plants, like creating these high floor networks that explore much, much finer areas of the soil pull water and other nutrients back. So for instance, um, a rhizobia, you'll have legumes forming relationships with rhizobia. Rhizobia fix, nit fix nitrogen, bring it to the plant. Rhizobia get energy in the form of sugars or carbohydrates. Uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi are the same thing. And what's really cool is the mycorrhizal fungi might reach out way beyond where that root network is and the mycorrhizal fungi might have um, symbiotic relationships with bacteria. And the bacteria are secreting things like phosphatases, which dissolve tiny, tiny amounts of phosphorus, pull it back through the, rhyze, uh, um, uh, the, um, the mycorrhizae into the roots. What do those guys get? They get sugar in exchange. Okay, so when we talk about soils as a living mutualistic ecosystem, you can't separate the plant from the soil and you can't separate the soil from the plant because all of the, the, the basis of the energy system in soils is sunlight. And the only guy that can get that going is the plant. If you don't have plants there and you, you won't let plants grow there, you often find a little bit of moss growing on the surface. And that's kind of nature's way of saying, hey, we need, we need energy down here. So the third principle is keep a live root in the soil year as, as many days of the year as possible. The fourth, fourth principle is diversity. And so in our cropping systems, you know, if you have a corn, wheat, soybean or a corn, soybean rotation, that's not much diversity because you're growing a, a warm season grass followed by a warm season legume. Well, one of your opportunities in the cover crop is growing a, a multi-species cover crop, you might find seven or eight different species in Jason's land over here. And each one of them have a, a, a very different function. You might have grasses, you've got legumes, you've got brassicas here as well. And so each one of them have a slightly different function. So that's the fourth principle uh, um, um, is um, 
diversity. And the fifth principle that we're really wanting to try and make happen here is that you want to integrate animals with, with your cropping systems. Now, the easy way is to, to buy manure in, but the, the best way to do that is start moving animals in. And if you think about, um, has anyone been to the Clemson Botanical Gardens there? Okay. That used to be, um, or that was probably, those soils were probably what the whole of South Carolina looked like at one stage. And we had uh, not only forested land, but native prairie land, uh, or prairie land that the Native Americans would burn so that the bison come across. Bison would come across, what would they do? Predators would keep them in tight herds. They'd eat here for maybe an hour or two, leave nothing on the ground except poop, urine, hair, snot, you name it. And two weeks later, that stuff would be coming up again. Oh, and they'd leave a lot of microbiology, uh, you know, in, in their poop. And that would transform the landscape. And so this is what we're trying to do. Anyone heard of mob grazing around here? Okay, mob grazing, very, very high intensity grazing, but with long, long rest periods. And so the idea, okay, I won't go into that right now, but uh, essentially what we're trying to do with all these five principles is mimic nature. Okay, I'm getting to, I promise you, I'll get to the story in a minute. So what the heck is a cover crop? All right. Hey there, how are you doing? I'm a lot lighter. What do you say? I'm a lot lighter. You're a lot lighter. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, congratulations, I hope. <laughs> so what is a cover crop? The conventional way that we've done our cropping systems over here, and I'm just taking a very simple one, is we'll grow corn, and then we'll grow soybeans, and then we'll grow corn, and we'll grow soybeans. So this is the legacy of trying to stabilize food prices from the Nixon era, okay? So reducing the, the diversity that we have. And then what's this thing called? Come on, you guys are from, you guys are from Clemson. What's this called? Here, can you read that? Oh. Fallow. That's like the F word, okay? Fallow. All right. So uh, you've essentially got corn and soybeans growing four months, maybe four and a half months out of the year and fallow the rest of the year. What did I say about what do plants do for the soils? They exude, that, exude carbohydrates, basically energy, pushing that energy into the soil. In natural systems, did we have seven and a half or eight months fallow a year? No. So what's going to happen to the soil? If it's not getting, what happens if you don't eat for three or four days, you kind of get scrawl, okay? You kind of get a little bit skinny and, and, and pretty hungry. Well, this is what we're essentially doing to the soils when we do that, okay? And so a cover crop, oh, well, okay, so when you do that, you're really disrupting your ecosystem. And if you till, um, you're doing it even more. So the soil is naked because it doesn't have any cover. It's hungry because it's not got any carbohydrates going. It's thirsty because we've disrupted the hydrologic cycle and it's running a fever because if you had to go here in late summer after you've harvested your corn and then you've tilled the land um, and you, you know it might be 100 degrees out, you're gonna find that you're gonna burn your feet. So if you're burning your feet, how in the world would we expect to find any kind of life on that soil? So we're disrupting the ecosystem when we don't have something growing in it and when we are tilling it. So this is what fallow looks like seven months of the year or 58% of the time. In nature, we don't have this kind of thing for very long because she's going to cover, cover this up pretty quickly with weeds and then herbs and forbs and everything else. So what is a cover crop? Basically... And, and this is a, a very simple system. If we have a corn and soybean system, uh, you would then grow a cool season cover, all right, behind the corn. And you'd plant the cool season cover in, you'd harvest your corn in about August. You'd plant the cool season cover about now or maybe two weeks before now. And by the time you get here, you might have eight to 10,000 pounds of biomass. And you do the same with soybeans. Have a cool season cover. So you're Rota alternating warm season crops with cool season crops, and because you're not harvesting anything, you can sort of add diversity over here. 
what we've been recently doing, and I'll share this with you later, is this little niche here is actually too warm to grow a cool season cover. So we've started growing a warm season cover right here as well, and, and I'll share that with you in a minute. But when you're talking about diversity, um, this is typical. This is a, a brassica. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a rye. This will be oats. This will be a vetch, and I think there might be crimson clover. There's crimson clover there. So we've got four species immediately apparent in that one, um, in, in that particular picture. But the idea, there's a guy called Dr. Dwayne Beck from Dakota Lakes Research Institute, says if you don't fill the niches, Mother Nature will fill them for you. So, uh, and, she, and he's talking especially about weeds. So if we do not fill those niches, Mother Nature is going to do that for us. And she's very good. Mother Nature is an opportunist. Depending on what your, what your view is, you've, you've either got Six, she's, she's got about 6,000 to 4.5 million years of R&D uh, on us, okay? So Mother Nature is just going to be much better at doing things. Cover crops, <laughs> I picked this up. I, I taught aquatic sciences, I think in 19, sorry, in 2008, when I taught aquatic sciences, cover crop, cro crops were a practice. And this was my vision of a cover crop. Now, basically, that somebody went in and disked a little bit of wheat in that might have been in the seed bin, okay? And so, oh, you know, that's a cover crop. It's a little bit green and stuff like that. This is a picture that I took two years ago. Um, I was in my friend's tractor. He had 9,000 pounds per acre. His rye was up to here, and he was planting through this. So he had a big, fat mat like that. I don't know if you... any. Any kind of weed that wants to try and grow out of that is just not going to stand a chance. What's real interesting is that these are my plant tissue. We took some tissue tests over here. Based on this, you had 270 pounds of nitrogen and 270 pounds of potash in, in, that, um, in that cover crop. The prescription for, say, 150 bushels of corn over here would be 150 pounds of nitrogen and 150 pounds of potash. So <laughs> he's got it all here. And he happens to grow really good corn with about, 50, about a third to a half of the nitrogen that his neighbors use. So that's kind of cool. And here you can see four inches of a mat. No weed's going to come up through that. And this is where his planter went through. So uh, he's, he's got a culture that opens up the soil, puts the seed in, and then he's got a, a closing wheel that will close that back up. But that's minimum disturbance uh, planting right there, y'all. Okay. Is it all moonlight and roses? Not, not always, but uh, this is a major thing. Can you guys see this over here? All right. This is where Jason went in. He cross-drilled his cover crops this way. You, you don't want to drill it the same way as, as you plant your corn rows. So he cross-drilled his cover crops this way in, in the fall, terminated them, and then planted his corn this way. What he did, though, there was a tiny little skip row over here that he, uh, he messed up, and there was about three foot that he didn't plant any cover crop. And can you see what his corn's doing here? It's a little bit yellower. And if you look a little bit more closely, you can actually see the residue there from his previous year's corn. There was a lot more residue. In other words, the soil biology munched all the residue, which might have been five or 6,000 pounds per acre of dry corn stalks. Munched it here, but left it over here. So it kind of shows you that what kind of a metabolism the soil has. And often, we, if you look up, you'll, you'll also see there's a lot of um, similarities between the soil uh, ecology and the rumen of a cow. You know, there's, there's this digestion. And what we do is we often say, you want to feed the microbes in the soil because they'll eat first, and then they will feed the plants. And so that's part of our attitude towards the soil as well. When the, there you go. Um, so... And when I talk about cover crops, don't say cover crops are the answer. Cover, or, or the, um, I, I want to tell you that cover crops alone are not the answer. Um, you, you've really got to use these things in an entirely systems approach. So uh, 
cut your tillage, diverse cropping rotations, all right, uh, multi-species cover crops. These are all animals. These are all tools you can use. Herbicides are also tools. Pesticides are also tools that we just discourage the use of, but sometimes we've got to use them if you're, if you're not an organic farmer. Um, uh, and the other thing, fertilizers are also tools. So these are, these are tools, but they are not things that you have to use, especially when you become less and less reliant on them in your system. And so this is, um, uh, the other thing that I wanted to say was when farmers see this, they come running back to, they don't run back to me, but they, they see this and they say, wow, look at this. Buzz, look at this. What's happening over here? That's absolutely amazing. So cover crops become an opening for farmers to say, hmm, maybe what that uh, fertilizer salesman told me, maybe that's not quite true. Maybe there's something more to this cover crop thing than, than meets the eye. And what we are sitting with, and um, I think you guys are very fortunate in that you're being taught differently, but we in, uh, out in the field are, being, are, are still sitting with the legacy of a reductionist view, a, a, a geochemical view of agriculture in the sense that we divide and sort what is undivided in nature. In other words, we say, okay, and you, got, you guys have a soil science department, you have a crop science department, then you have an animal science department. And really, you know, we should be smushing those guys together because, I mean, it's difficult enough for guys down the corridor to go and talk to one another. But really what we're, what we're seeing is if we're looking at a system, we've got to look at the whole system together uh, because uh, a, a, a plant that is grown in a sterile soil is going to be, be growing very different to what it might look like in a soil that's well fed, that's, that's had animals on it and things like that. So um, this is what we've sort of inherited and we're beginning to see out in, to, in the field that soils are, are really different. Uh, they're living dynamic, they, they change all the time, they're mutualistic. In other words, stuff inside them, there's a lot of mutualistic relationships going on, okay? Um, a lot of symbiosis going on, especially between the soil microbes and the plants. And um, Jeff just alluded to this. Look, he's, a, he's, a, he's one of your stars there as well. Um, a few years ago, I went out and it, uh, spent a lot of time with scientists across the country talking about soil health because one of the reasons why I did the series, USDA paid for me to do it, was because there was a lot of pushback that all the soil health stuff is pseudoscience. And so we wanted to kind of say, okay, is it pseudoscience? Let's speak to these guys. And, and you know, these guys are pretty, uh, that soil scientists, uh, soil microbiologists, agronomists, um, things like that. This guy's a trip, Dwayne Beck, if, if, you, if you ever, he's, he's really funny. So, um, but, um, so these guys are guys who understand that soil is a living, mutualistic ecosystem. All right, now going back to my story. City Roots, about five years ago, I started um, a conservation innovation grant with a guy called Eric McClam and his dad, Robbie, and we started going no-till in a, uh, an organic farm. And how, how, how did that go, David? Going totally no-till in an organic farm. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> It's, it, it's tough going in, in, in an environment where you can't use herbicides as tools. So these guys, what we did was, the outcome was we cut back from about six or seven uh, tillage events per year to about one or two. Um, and there you can see Eric rolling a cover crop. He's got a roller cr crimper. But one of the things uh, I started measuring was the, the nutrients in the soils. And for five years, these guys had not applied nutrients. And I was saying, okay, well, let's see how fast your nutrients are being drawn down. And I noticed that the nutrients, if anything, the phosphorus was going up and the potassium wasn't going down near as much as the crops were removing. So what in the world was that? I started a, another conservation innovation grant with these 
crazy cats from the coastal plains. They're all Clemson graduates and Clemson fans. So what the heck are they doing with a city boy from Africa from Gamecock University? I don't know, but they, we started something there. Uh, and mainly to look at nitrogen in soils. Um, and the idea was that if we grow nit uh, if we grow cover crops and we grow our own nitrogen, you know, we can cut back on nitrogen. Now I want to tell you, do you know, do you know what this stands for? Uh, if, if you guys ever get to hear Dr. Ahmed Khalilian, he was the king of subsoiling at one stage. He's, he's saying cover crops do a better job of this. So subsoil, uh, especially in the coastal plain, you often have what is known as an E horizon before you get to your, your B horizon. So here's your A horizon here. Don't forget that O, okay? And in the old, basically you take a subsoiler, which is a 24 inch shank, and you've got to put 40 horsepower per shank in the soil. So if you've got six shanks, you've got to have a 240 horsepower machine. And so they were ripping that through. Now that subsoiler is going to cost you about $20 an acre. So they've stopped. One of the reasons why cool season cover crops work, what happens to soils when they get wet mechanically? They really get get real soft, right? I mean, that's why you get stuck in, in, in a wet field. Well, the same thing, our plant roots are going down into E-horizons, uh, through the E-horizon and getting down into that, that B-horizon now and accessing those nutrients. So the farmer doesn't have to have the shank there. So for a $20, $20 per acre cover crop, the farmer can have an, a pretty much immediate return on investment in that first year. Um, Part of that is also, a lot of this is psychological. Our dependence on pesticides and herbicides and especially um, um, chemical fertilizers. There's a, there's a psychological dependence, I'm pretty convinced. We've got basically 10,000 acres now in Dillon County with five farmers that I'm working with where we've quit applying phosphorus and because we've been taking plant tissue tests where we have low phosphorus numbers, soil test numbers, we've been able to convince our farmers we don't have a phosphorus problem. I think we're going into the point where we're going to be doing the same with potassium. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. The economics of cover crops, if they're done right, are, are fantastic. And, and often that's a mental thing. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the importance of animals. Uh, yeah. What are the implications for animals like Jason, for instance? Is he, is he grazing cover crops? I, I wish he could. The implication is animals are a pain in the ass. Okay. All right. So you've, you've got to, with, 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 a crop, with a cropping system, you've got, uh, you're, you're automating everything, right? So one, one guy like Jason can run 500 acres, no problem. Another guy, you know, might be able to do 11, 1200 acres without, you know, without any problem at all. So when you've got animals, when you bring those in, they get stolen, they get sick. You can't leave them for a day without water. So it be brings in a huge logistical uh, uh, issue as well. With that aside, though, how does it affect the cropping system? Because you no longer have a six-inch mat of organic matter, obviously. Yes. So, how does, so do you allow uh, these prescribed grazes? Do you allow it, them to it, clear the entire place? It would be prescribed grazing. You'd want to basically leave about six inches of, of residue. You don't want to clear it completely enough. Do that by uh, giving them certain variations? Of well, certain as, soon as, as soon as you move that fence, as soon as you move that fence, they're going to lose interest in what they've just grazed. So you strip graze them, and oh, basically so the more, them yeah, the they love that Fall green. Over, exactly, exactly. Okay, so it's just a, uh, an issue of. Um, it's of, it's a logistic. Management. It's it's okay. management intensive. Yes, sir. The fifth principle. Integrating animals into it's your into your system. <clears throat> I mean, back in the day, in that's the what we day, did. That's what we did. That's what we did. Before, before, our, before World War II. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That's what we did. Well, the, the horrible soils in the Carolinas, I think, for, I know, Wilkes County, a lot of the um, pork and chicken, poultry producing areas of the Carolinas also became great um, corn producing areas. Yeah. I'm not sure which 
the chicken or the egg yeah. came first, yeah. figuratively speaking. But the, without the manure, you couldn't have grown the, yeah. the corn that they did. Absolutely. It's yeah. Absolutely impossible in the crappy right. soil. Yeah. 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 Have you had any success with cutting for uh, hay crop or um, I only have one farmer that that go, has dairy cows and cuts uh, cuts silage, and he we really don't like what silage does um, when it chops chops silage really low. So we're, we're I'm trying to persuade him to leave a little bit more residue on the ground, but yeah, so, uh, maybe even more. So um, I don't know that much about silage, but I think he sees the effect, and so he's growing a lot more corn for grain for his, his girls. Um, but but certainly, when you've got silage, carbon on, on carbon removal is is you know essentially carbon, even though it's dead carbon, you know your your plant dies and everything is still really really essential for for soil microbes as it decomposes. So. I'm not advocating that we stop haylage and silage, but we've got to be really careful to leave. If you're going to leave any, if, if you're going to cut, you might want to leave some behind and immediately go after there and, and plant a cover crop. But, you know, ideally, I think animals have four legs. And as we get smarter and smarter of, about automating animals, you know, maybe putting collars on them and ba basically strip grazing like them like that, or putting um, a wire next to the, behind the um, pivot system, you know, trying to automate grazing systems uh, so that animals are well cared for, they have shade, they have water, but they're moving, you know, uh, all the time, I think is going to be a real breakthrough for us. When I said hayward silage, I meant of your cover crop. Sorry? When I said hayward silage, I meant of your cover crop. Of, of the cover Yes. Did he come in afterwards? No, no, he's never done that. What what we do is roll it, roll it. Yeah, roll and crimp it. That's the best way. That's the best practice. I, um, <laughs> I think the jury's still. I think. Yeah, no, I don't know. I, I, that's a, that's a very very good question. Um, in in most cases, I think it's the better practice because. Uh, if you leave it up and you plant into that, what you can get is vole damage. The voles will come out and they'll figure out where the corn seeds are. Mm -hmm. So vole damage is, is one of the problems. The, the, the other problem is that if you don't terminate that cover crop really well, uh, and it might, it's a little bit more tricky if you're terminating a standing cover crop, um, you may have some competition from, a, from the cover. And we saw that this year, corn yields, if your corn has a bad day, you know, it's being shaded out by that cover, you know, then it really does affect yields. So, uh, on the other hand, I've seen a fantastic cover, a, a cotton um, being planted into a standing rye cover, a standing uh, oats cover, and basically it never had any thrip infestations. So, that's what I'm saying. I, it might be it might be crop specific mm -hmm. and also cover crop specific. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Exactly. I, I assume you were taking the cover crop down, but is anybody like mowing it down? Is there a benefit to crimping it at the, at the base of the stalk? When you mow it, it gets a little bit haphazard. Uh -huh. So if, you, if you're using a conventional planting system, uh, it's going to get very tricky to okay. uh, open that residue, put the well, seed in and close. It breaks down a lot. And that's what I was thinking too. Is it better if it's better to have it released gradually? Well, I don't know. <laughs> like what Dave's doing with vegetables, no till vegetables, you want the, the mat down there to suppress weed growth. Yeah. You know, like if he mows it, it breaks down quicker and then that leads to gaps for weeds. Okay. Yeah. It's also a lot more horsepower farm and mowing versus just going right. to deal with the crepper. Yeah. Like running a tractor PTO with a mower takes a lot more gas, a lot more time too. Uh, whereas you can you know, put it in the and you're going to kill the prepper and be done with it. Did, do you have any issues? Are there any crops that aren't able to push up through that mat? Or does the, when you're planting, does it spread the mat so the seedlings can grow up? We're planting by hand, but we're using a free transplant instead of like direct seed. And like Buzz is talking about using direct seed corn and lower yeah. seed stuff. So you wouldn't want to try to put small seed vegetables. Um, small seeds, small seeds. Yeah, so that, that'll be tricky. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and you also have residue handlers that will open it up a little bit. Okay. So, just a thin channel just for the seedlings. Exactly, yeah. So, but, you know, in conventional, you know, if you do have small seeds, maybe like yeah. rape seed or something like that, you want to make sure that your cover is terminated. So, hence the use of herb herbicides. I'd love for us to get to the point where we don't use herbicides, but that's, you know, I would rather use herbicides than till. I think herbicides are much less uh, environmentally destructive than tillage. That's only my opinion. So you said you need to get into more layers for the nitrogen fixation. What, what are you using right now and how do you want to Okay. I, I, I want to get more legumes in front of the corn, in front of the soybeans. I want to rather have more grass-heavy mix because the soybeans are going to fix their own nitrogen. So typically, yeah. We have a mix right now that we're working with um, in, in front of corn, so usually behind soybeans or cotton, but in, in front of corn, um, uh, we would have something like uh, seven pounds uh, rye, uh, five pounds oats, um, uh, probably three pounds woolly pod vetch, uh, maybe two to three pounds of a hairy vetch, and then four pounds of crimson clover. And if we plant early enough, so right now until about October the 15th, we throw two pounds radish uh, and, and put that in. We've been using rapeseed, but we find it really difficult to kill. It'll come back up and come back up and come back up. But this is the kind of mix that we have where uh, we still have it grass heavy. Um, what happens is if you try and plant just these guys, the, the broad leaves in front of corn, I mean, the corn responds beautifully, but then by the time you get in there and, you know, within four weeks, that whole residue has melded, it's your, your ground is bare. So we want to add the grasses to make sure we've got a soil armor over here. The yeah. Well, it, the, what what you're doing? Remember, your rye and your your rye and your oats are going to inhabit one part of the canopy. Your woolly pod and hairy vetch are going to climb up here. Okay. Your crimson clover is going to be basically ground cover, and then your radish is a prostrate plant. So every part of your canopy is covered when growing, but when, when this is terminated, the only thing that's going to stay for a while is your rye, or your rye or your oats, because they, they've got a low carbon to, a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. These guys will go, these other guys, these guys will go in three or four weeks, boom, they're gone. How do you ensure that this many pounds per acre is just uh, well, you, you're going to mix it up front. So you, you, you get your seed dealer, you know, so guys have... You're saying how many pounds is it seed per acre? Oh, sorry, excuse me, pounds per acre, yeah. Excuse okay. me, excuse me, yeah. Pounds per acre. So basically, the guy will calculate the percentages, mix it up in a, um, in a hopper, and then you will take that mix and put it in your... Seed drill. I think the rule of thumb is you divide, you know, say if you're going to put out 100 pounds of rye per acre, if you have 10 species in your mix, you cut it by 10. Okay. You divide by 10. Yeah. That's, just a, that's, a, that's a good rule of thumb, yeah. yeah. And remember that the diversity index, if you think about crop diversity or plant diversity, you can think of it, um, there's a guy called... Mark Liebig, and he's got the crop diversity chart, if you want to look at that. But you can divide plants up into warm and cool season uh, grass and broadleaf. So a warm season grass would be corn, milo, uh, sorghum sedan, okay? A cool season, uh, sorry, a warm season grass, excuse me. Cool season grass would be oats, Rye, wheat, triticale, okay. Uh, warm season broadleaf, uh, and you can divide these into legumes uh, and and regular broadleaf. You know, warm season broadleaf would be something like um, uh, uh, soybean, 
um, uh, n n n let's not worry about alfalfa. Um, Cowpea, no, buckwheat, and buckwheat might be over here, right? But yeah, cowpea, buckwheat, cowpea is a, a classic, yeah, um, I don't know why I wasn't thinking about that one. Uh, uh, radish, and I'm putting them in the middle because you can plant these guys sort of towards the end of the war growing season, they'll do pretty well in this climate. Um, and then cool season would be clovers, vetch, um, and I'm trying to think of uh, other broadleafs, uh, but that's kind of the, the system. So the reason why I bring this up is you want to try and follow a warm season. The best thing to follow a warm season uh, grass or precede a warm season grass would be with a cool season broadleaf or, or, or um, a, a cool season broadleaf or legume. So you want to increase your diversity on that sort of on those two dimensions, warm and cool versus a broadleaf and legume. And so that's how we like increasing our diversity. And diversity is not just sort of a um, sort of an abstract uh, nicety. But the more diverse system you have, the less pest pressure you are ultimately going to encounter. Because when you have diverse systems, you're going to encourage predators and everything. Again, the soil is a, is a, is a mutualistic, dynamic ecosystem. And then the, the different root architecture with all those sorts of plants. You Absolutely. Know, the diversity yep. of microbes yep. that you might right. not normally get. Right. Yes, sir. So the idea that develop over thousands of years, I guess, that soil gets exhausted by our agriculture is essentially only half true. Or not. It, in other words, it grows with live root in the soil and the exudate. The sun is going into the soil, essentially. Sun that's, that's a fantastic. The root. That's a fantastic question. So, if you if you have a look at, by the way, the Iroquois, when when the white man came in. He basically reduced corn yields with the moldboard plow by 70%. The Iroquois were producing great corn yields before we came along. Um, but um, they were smaller in volume because they were smaller in Small, But they also knew how to grow that stuff and work with the ecosystem. But going back to that, I don't think it's thousands of years, although I suppose that has, you know, slash and burn, we come and we come and grow a crop and then we move on. There are some cultures like that. But our approach to agriculture for a long time has been extractive. What, 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 do, the, what, do, the, um, what do the Amish and the, uh, the Mennonites do? The Amish and Mennonites kind of move into a place that's kind of been really depleted. And they go in and, and they build those soils up and they build those farms up. And how do they do it? They're, they're just working with nature, keep, keeping straw on the land, using animals, that kind of thing. So their approach, the Amish approach, is regenerative. Go to any kind of Amish farming system. Look at the, uh, if, you, if you have a look at, um, oh gosh, okay, what, what the Chinese used to do, um, you know, maybe 100 years ago, Part of the, the culture over there, it was kind of the polite thing to do. If you invited me to your house, I would go to your privy at the end of the evening and, and take a little bit of a dump and do a little bit of a lick because that would go back onto my land or my neighbor's land. So there was this real understanding that this was a closed system, whereas an extractive idea is, you know, I think there was, there was a time when we kind of felt that it was a virtue to sort of work the land and, and to deplete the land. And so we're, we're, we're turning to this sort of, again, I think this is kind of a mentality approach that, that we don't have to dominate the land with, to, to get something out of it, but working with land. And I think essentially at the heart of that Depleting the soil was this whole idea that it's extractive. Plants only take stuff out, they never put stuff back in. And so by rediscovering some of these things, you know, it's, it's really liberating to farmers. And if you want to go into that kind of stuff, it's, it's really liberating to say, I don't, 
have to be addicted to chemicals and, and fertilizers, but these are two, if I need to use them, I can use them, but if, if I don't use them, I'm not going to lose my livelihood, and farmers are being liberated by that idea. And I, and I, I guess in principle, agree with it, but I'm still stuck on the math. Yeah. We are extracting something from the land, and we take it to a market, or a seller, or a wholesaler, yeah. Yeah. or a retailer, and that's not just sunlight. We have extracted <clears throat> something the earth. Yes, yes. And so in order to replace it, apparently, there's a balance of <sighs> cover crops might do it. I'm totally open to that. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Well, I, you're, you're, I, I think our biggest limiting nutrient in the future, uh, you know, we're learning how to get nitrogen. Phosphorus is going to be a problem. Uh, in the future because we're moving a lot of phosphorus out. Potassium basically from the weathering of our soils is going to be less of a problem. But we are using phosphorus and, and potash and those things in, in amounts that might be 10 to 15 times more than is necessary. So uh, we've got legacy phosphorus right now. The farmers that I'm working with, I don't think they'll be applying phosphorus nor will their children be applying phosphorus. But yes, we are drawing those down. We're also seeing, for instance, Gabe Brown's got about 20 years of data so far. His soil test values are doing this uh, over the last 20 years, but his plant tissue tests continue to go up. And that's because this is not just a chemical system, this is a biological system. Soil biology is a lot more efficient Soil biology, now I'm not a big fan of Walmart, but soil biology is like Walmart. Farmers will accept a